Hi, I just wanted to mention something before the show. If you've been to the website, you may see that I post my blog as a comic. Well, if you've ever wondered where it all began, how it all started, or just wanted to check it out from the beginning, or the fact that it's not necessarily the easiest way to look at it if you want to see more of them. So I set up an email subscription where you can just sign up and it will send you a comic each day from the very beginning. Go to AmericanBandito.com slash book. I couldn't think of a better name to put. Book seemed easy. It's one word. Each day, I will just send you a page from the daily blog. When you go to that page, you'll see the very first one that I did uh, when the whole thing started, when we found out that my wife had breast cancer. And the whole story kind of leads up to what became this podcast, what became what I'm doing today. It's free. If it's not for you, you can just unsubscribe. I mean, there's no obligation. No salesman will visit your door. Sorry, that seemed natural to go into that. So if you want to check it out, go to AmericanBandito.com slash book. Now here's the show. I'm Tom Ray, and this is American Bandito. All right, so last summer, my wife and I and a few friends went to an underground film screening that we had heard about. It was happening in the new Coney Island studios over on Atwood Avenue. The films playing were a collection of independently made films, the, the kind that you need an old projector for, like the kind they used in classrooms back in the 1900s. And it sputtered in the background while we watched these short films. I'm James Krell. I'm a freelance film critic and freelance film programmer here in town. My website is the Madison Film Forum at madfilm.org. Now, he was the one that found these films and brought them to Madison to show to people. The whole thing was really cool. My wife knew him from back when she used to manage the Orpheum in Sundance. And when I was contacting people this season for the show, I knew he was a person I wanted to talk with. He was on the north side of town, and it was finally a nice day in the spring. So we decided to go sit outside at Warner Park, and I wanted to talk to him about his deep connection with film in Madison. Or were you from here, or? Oh, yeah, born and raised. Raised on the near west side, sort of the Westmoreland neighborhood. Went to West High School, and then did my undergrad here at UW in the Com Arts Department. I guess it took maybe a year off, year and a half off. Went to grad school, also in film, sort of the film critical study side of uh, film studies. So I had been, as an undergrad, very active in film production and was active with a group that did open shows where we'd have, you know, anyone who had a recent video, like, bring it in, we'll show it. Most of it was fellow students in the production classes, but, you know, it was really open to anyone. As I transi transitioned to the studies, I did a little bit of production while I was in grad school and actually taught some of the production classes, but uh, my studies moved towards the critical studies, history side of side of film studies. Why'd they move that way? That's sort of the focus of the department uh, at the graduate level. So if, you, if I were to, I, actually that was a debate I had with myself, whether I would pursue production advanced degree, like an MFA, yeah. and really that would mean going somewhere else, or whether I wanted to sort of focus on the history of experimental filmmaking. That's sort of what it, where it ended up going in terms of the research and the dissertation. You know, there were great professors here, a lot of great resources here. So, um, you know, I eventually just sort of wandered in, in that direction. Well, what led up to you even going to school for it all together? Like, were you making movies? You were just interested? Actually, that goes back to high school. At West, there were two really cool elective classes. One was a film study class that was taught by Bill Keyes, a very popular teacher in, at Madison West in that period. So that got me thinking about, you know, how films were made. At the time, I, going into it, I didn't think I was a very good writer, and I liked the expressiveness of certain films that thought maybe there'd be a way to, if I could learn more about that, instead of, you know, being hindered by the writing stuff, I could, you know, express myself visually. But what was great about that class was it really improved my writing. Okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Keyes was a great writing teacher. That's where I met my friend Jay Antani. He and I are sort of lifelong friends, and we were both very interested in film, and that sort of bonded us. We made some, you know, films and videos together in high school, both taking, uh, having taken that uh, film study class. But also there was a mass media class where you actually produced films and. I mean, excuse me, uh, video. You're saying like actual production of it, not yeah, just like yeah. I have a video recorder. Yeah, yeah. There, were, uh, there wasn't much in terms of equipment, but at that point, you know, camcorders are getting cheaper or portable yeah. cameras. And for one project we did, yeah, I sort of lugged this, uh, you know, the deck along with the camera to all the locations. 
And actually, we we still had to sort of edit it in camera, if you know what I mean. Like, yes. uh, you know, the the next shot would have to be set up. We'd record, and then we'd have to, you know, if the locations change, then don't don't move the tape. <laughs> just uh, just uh, keep it keep it uh, keep it in the machine because yeah. we gotta gonna have to uh, re press record in a in a few hours when we're on the next location. I made on my own a short sort of experimental piece that ended up winning a prize at the Student Film and Video Festival on campus. What was it? Oh, it was called Survival Supplies. I was working at a sort of a mom and pop drugstore that had this garbage can that actually was a repurposed old, uh, like a survival supplies, civil defense can. Okay, okay. <laughs> and it had this, you know, these instructions on how to use what was originally in the can in the event of a you know catastrophe. And so that was the text that I read in various voices as different images were appearing. <laughs> so um, that experience led me to meet a lot of other people who were older than myself, who were um, active in film and video, sort of like sort of juniors and seniors that were in this group called Independent Film and Video Collaborative. I got involved with, you know, helping out on productions for classes that uh, I wasn't eligible to be in yet you know okay. uh, so but they needed like here could you hold the boom <laughs> for right. you know yeah as an undergrad then I got more involved in that group um, would always try to make something new for these open film and video shows that we would have every semester so even if I didn't think it was great I was like oh well what, there's the target date that's when we're gonna show something so I would okay. try to make something for for that uh, that show what would you say your style was? Two key moments were um, at a meeting of this experimental, uh, excuse me, the uh, Independent Film and Video Collaborative, I saw two films that really sort of blew my mind. One is The End by Christopher McLean. I kind of like the really playful, funny experimental stuff. Okay. And so The End, while it, the worldview is very dark, it's about the last day in the lives of five different people as they're, you know, as basically okay. the earth is about to go kaput. Ooh, uh, yeah, yeah, very, but uh, <laughs> there's this deadpan humor to it and a, a visually extremely playful. Uh, and well, and then on the, on the reverse side, sometimes there's long passages of just a black screen while he's talking in this sort of monotone nice. voice. And then uh, the filmmaker George Kuchar, who um, started making films in the 60s with his twin brother, Mike. He ended up being a huge influence on John Waters and also on Warhol and some other folks. Again, very playful, very quirky, funny films. Humor would be one part of what almost all my films had some element of humor. You know, just like uh, I liked editing a lot. So uh, there was another film that was sort of advanced, actually it was a directed study project, was a found footage film I made. It was called Autobiographiti. One afternoon I got a call from a friend saying, hey, did you did you see that pile of film that was over uh, at such and such corner? Someone who used to run a local production company, like a commercial company, was just throwing out all reel after reel of 16 millimeter films from, oh. you know, and who knows what was on them. So, yeah, I just sort of drove over there and put as many boxes in the back of my car <laughs> and really? uh, yeah um, and from that I just sort of slowly went through and some of it was negative footage some of it was positive footage and who knows it was like a lot of car dealership ads from like John Lancaster from the 70s you never know you're gonna get right. Winnebago man yeah 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 exactly yeah <laughs> and it was all like just uh, very little of it had uh, it, uh, it sound it was all just sort of the image tracks okay so um, I pieced that together in a way that, uh, again, sort of had a sort of goofy voiceover company. But that also won a prize at the uh, Student Film and Video Festival that the uh, Wisconsin Union Directed put on every year. When was this? This was, let's see, that first one would have been, Autobiography would be 91 or 92. Okay. And then that uh, Survive Supplies would have been like 89. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that was sort of my undergrad window there. You're like involved in tons of stuff, so I'm also curious, like, <laughs> how are you part of all this? Well, the experience with the production group as an undergrad and at Wisconsin Union Directorate sort of gave me some of the fundamentals of how to make things happen. I mean, you know, in both cases, the resources were already there in terms of existing programs and, and having a venue and the projection equipment and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, just showing up at uh, Wisconsin Union Directorate meetings and learning how 
to deal with the distributors and mm. and what's involved in renting films and things like that. You know, I got together with some like-minded grads who were sort of disappointed in the lack of certain types of films that were coming into, into town. Um, so we created another group called the Madison Film Forum, which brought in mostly experimental, but also some documentaries and then things like a big transitional film for us was um, Amir Costa Rica's Underground, which had won the Palme d'Or. And familiar. yeah, there was just a string of films that like really should have played Madison, but just were not playing, were not coming. So we sort of shifted our gears to like, what are these films that really should have some kind of Madison screening, but just aren't getting there? It's, you know, certainly some art films would come to the Majestic, right. but certain films, unless there was sort of a built-in audience, like just weren't coming. In fact, one key transition in terms of how films were covered in town was back in the day, if you go back and look at an old isthmus from, you know, before this period, yeah. anything, uh, any film on campus wouldn't be in the main movie listings. It would be in a separate section on campus and then a subdivision film. Okay. You know, at the time, a lot of restrictions on campus rentals in terms of where you could or could not advertise what they called the, the non-theatrical market. So. The Wisconsin Union Directorate would bring in films that had already played the theatrical market, you know, the local theaters. They'd be able to get access to the prints, but sort of on the condition that they would just advertise sort of locally on campus. There's also another market specifically geared to like uh, campuses and such, which is basically the idea is you're not seven day a week theater. You'd be like a weekend rather than a full daily program. And um, you actually deal with a different distributor, there's sort of this company, there's a couple companies, one's called Swank, and one is called, I think it was Criterion, different from the Criterion label, okay. uh, the, not the DVD company, but um, they would get the right the rights to, sh to rent the films to campuses. When we're doing the F Mass and Film Forum, we helped transition out of that sort of campus ghetto coverage for, the f for films, because we started bringing, the strategy was, what could we bring in that if, say, Isthmus wants to say, we are a resource for what's going on in film in town, they can't not cover us. <laughs> right. yeah. So that was actually one of the motivations for bringing in Underground, mm -hmm. because, you know, if that plays in town, like, someone's got to cover it. So I started learning about different distributors as well. Like, the experimental side of things, there are two main distributors called the Filmmakers Co-op in New York and then Canyon Cinema in San Francisco. Hmm. A lot of the 16 millimeter prints that are circulating now in sort of historical avant-garde films. A lot of those are, are still to this day available through those, those two resources. Another current sort of gap in what's going on in Madison now is there's not a lot of experimental programming going on. There was a subcommittee at Wood, the Wisconsin Union Director, called um, Starlight Cinema. And around the time I was an undergrad, that sort of used to be sort of internet art, international art film, and it trans transmuted yeah, into yeah. into sort of more underground and experimental stuff. So that's how I also got exposed to a lot more stuff, not just historical stuff like filmmakers like Richard Kern actually came to town. Oh, cool. Yeah, 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 kind of interesting guy to meet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Has an interesting sensibility, but uh, currently there's not a regular experimental screening going on right now. When I started, at least I had access or exposure to some stuff, which led me to ask more questions and then, oh, how do I find out about this yeah. and, and how do I get them? Where the starting point right now is a little more difficult, even though I think everyone thinks, oh, because of the internet, oh, we have access to everything. But there's some stuff that, yeah, because they're only available on 16 millimeter, you can you, may, you can find bootlegs and stuff like that, but yeah. it's it's hard to know how to how to start, especially a more historical avant-garde series. Let alone even knowing how to run a projector, right. get hold of oh, one. Right, right, yeah, that's, well, that's the other thing. Because you're gonna break that film yeah, if yeah, you don't know. Yeah, 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 that's another issue is just access to equipment. If you don't have access to a 16 millimeter, millimeter projector, then, you know, what do you do? <laughs> yeah, you can't even go to like a local school anymore because right. they don't have them. They sold those off ages ago. Yeah. Around, the si around the time I found that big pile of film, you know, <laughs> okay. that guy, whoever it was, was maybe still in business, but he was probably moving on to video for mm -hmm. ma making commercials on video. So Madison Film Forum 
started bringing in some of the stuff that should have been brought in. Then around that time, uh, a new project emerged. Leah Jacobs, a professor in the Comm Arts Department, secured funding for a new series, and that was called The Cinematheque. Yes. Uh, so that's she envisioned it as envisioned it as sort of a coalition of departments who wanted to do you know different types of film programming. So a lot of it would be initiated by the Com Arts Department, but also like the German department always had these sort of touring German films that they had an opportunity to to get, but you know where would they show them? It was just sort of the idea was sort of unify all those sort of disparate projects under one umbrella and like streamline the publicity and then everyone knows on Friday and Saturday there's something cool going on at, at, at the Cinematheque. Yeah. Because it was, it's this new entity, the, there was a new position, a project assistantship was assigned to help run things. So I was the first project assistant for the Cinematheque as it, as it oh. yeah, so that's how that started. Just happened to be there at the right it time? Was, or? It was a combination of she knew what I was working on with the film, Madison Film Forum and seeing like I was doing a lot of the stuff that okay. like had acquired a lot of the skills that would be needed for this job. Mm -hmm. Right around that time then, the Wisconsin Film Office was thinking about this crazy idea of doing a what they wanted to call the Great Wisconsin Film Festival, uh, right? And then yeah. they had their idea, which was going to be downtown, you know, like at the Orpheum and the Majestic and so forth. Another organization on campus called the Arts Institute emerged, uh, UW Art Institute. That was the time of the early stages of the Overture Foundation. Ah, uh, yes. Right? So lots of money, big idea, central, you know, whatever it was going to be, it was mm -hmm. going to be big and it was going to be, you know, sort of take over that block where the Overture Center is now. The first head of the Arts Institute was Tino Balio, who uh, was, at the time, the chair of the Com Arts Department. He got involved in talking with the, the film office folks, trying to get a role for the campus to be a part of this larger, great Wisconsin Film Festival. Mm -hmm. So the plan, as of a certain point, was the, the downtown screenings would be handled by the Wisconsin Film Office. And then there would be a campus component, which would be run by, oh, the people who do the Cinematheque, and then that was me. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, with everyone else, but uh, you know, I would, I would be involved in that. And then Wisconsin Union Directorate. There was a very active student at uh, Wisconsin Union Directorate named Wendy Wager, who um, was mm -hmm. at the time head of Starlight Cinema. Wendy had just been at Sundance and Slam Dance, like you know, the uh, Slam Dance Film Festival, sort of embedded in the middle of uh, the Sundance Film Festival. So we were going to do the funky stuff and really just basically do what we were doing already, just more of it for one weekend. Then Tino gets a, a memo uh, from the film office saying, oh, well, we have to cancel. Oh. So here's a draft of our cancellation announcement. And actually, I still have this to this day, a photocopy of like his notes on how he wants to like handle like this not the he doesn't want to handle it the way they did which was they wanted to say just outright it's canceled so it's just stopped. written in big letters it just said it's canceled <laughs> i think well uh you know i'd have to take a look at it again uh, exactly but it basically was oh the campus folks won't mind they could still do their stuff but we're not going to call this the wisconsin film you know we'll save this for when we have all the pieces together and can sort of pull it off right but and then, because of that, then the first festival was just what we had planned. What was supposed to be just the campus component ended up being the first festival. The last thing I did myself making something was um, at the Kukaloris Film Festival in North Carolina, Wilmington, North Carolina, where I lived. Um, one year they did the 10 by 10 screening, which was 10 filmmakers teamed up with 10 local bands Oh. And then you make 10 music videos and you, um, yeah. you had a week and you didn't know until like the week before it was due, everyone put their names in a hat and then, you know, you just pulled out, you know, here's, the, here's filmmaker one, here's band one, go. I was sort of a late um, participant in it. It ended up the band that I got picked with had no time, so I just made this sort of goofy but fun five You just minute. used their music? Yeah, yeah, they okay. just gave me their music. That wasn't the original idea of the, you know, the, the, the original idea for the, for the event was, you know, definitely work with the filmmaker 
it turned out, yeah, they just didn't have any time. So they're like, don't worry about it. Just go ahead and do your thing. Were they too popular or they <laughs> no, were just they too were, lazy? No, I wouldn't say too lazy. No, just, well, you know, like any working musician, they, you know, they they have their day jobs and all this kind of stuff. That's what I figured. Yeah, and yeah. in life, you know. And I think that would be a good way, you know, crossover, uh, networking, and, and too much of Madison's art scene is very isolated and, yeah. you know, not enough communication between maybe all the film folks know all the film stuff going on, but they don't know what band is playing wherever. And same with, you talk to people who are very into, say, the theater scene here. Mm -hmm. They don't know what this thing is showing here. It'd be nice to have certain types of events that encourage people to sort of cross over. And Just at the most basic level, bands are always looking for somebody to do a video for them, and people who make movies are always looking for music to right, put into right, their movies. Right, right. Yeah, you know, you'd think we'd all be talking to each other about all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Had I told you the story uh, off, you know, or what, what the name of it? I, yeah, vaguely, it's, vaguely. So it's like, either way, I was going to tell you the whole story. Right, now, cause for the listeners. Just because I know yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. mean anybody oh, else does. Oh, uh, you know, okay, then I'll just move on. No. <laughs> it will be called Mills Folly Micro Cinema. Mm -hmm. I didn't want a filmy name, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like Sprockets or something like that. I wanted a name that had a story sort of built in, because uh, inspired by... In New York, there was, uh, for a long time, the Robert Beck Memorial Cinema. Okay. And, of course, you hear that, and it's like, well, who's Robert Beck? This Robert Beck, um, they found in a clipping from teens or the 20s, um, hmm. a gentleman who was a World War I veteran who had lost his sight. But he regained his sight in the middle of a movie screening. You know, so the, the power of cinema restored his sight. Now, who knows how true this actually I got two is questions he, right yeah, there. Yeah. What was he doing there? What was he doing there, and then yeah. why did he get his sight back? Anyway. I mean, it's a good example of whatever the truth is, print the legend. Right. Like, it's a great story. So they named their series the Robert Beck Memorial Cinema. I mean, yeah. it, it was true enough to make the paper. I've seen the it clip. Works, yeah. yeah. Knowing that the series was going to be sort of in the Atwood area, I was like, trying to look for like either a geographical reference or you know something that would be tied to the neighborhood but not like so tied to the neighborhood that if I end up moving uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, moving the location somewhere else I wouldn't be in the next version of Broom Street Theater on Willie Street yeah. you know or something like that so I found in uh, historic Madison what was first called Elmside, the mansion over on Summers Avenue, mm -hmm. um, that I, I know it has a more current name. It was built by Simeon Mills back in 1860, I want to say 62, okay. somewhere there. At that point, that was so far east that all the townspeople called it Mills Folly because no one would want to do the commute from <laughs> all the way out there to downtown, what's now downtown Madison. All right. So. Mills Folly, I was like, that's, I, I, I like that. Uh, a, I like the ring of it, Mills Folly Micro Cinema, but also, you know, he was on the fringe, and we're going to try to be on the fringe as well with our programming. So, yeah. And also, you know, just the word folly, it's, it is sort of sheer folly to do this kind of work in a way. Like, it's sort of like running against the windmill, like there's all these images that are being thrown at us all the time to sort of respond to it with more images yeah. <laughs> seems like why would you bother doing this when there's we have access to all these images but it's actually it is worth it because there's uh you know there's stuff out there that we should be seeing and hearing that um unless someone uh goes out and gets it and sort of collects people together to watch it uh, yeah. it's not going to happen so i thought it would have been vaudevillian because that seems like jim's follies yeah, or whatever yeah, it also has that association which i like which is uh showmanship kind of mm -hmm. uh, quality to it so i liked all those associations so how can people get involved in that it's very early stages i'd say i'm in the slow process of like setting up a twitter page and most of the information will be on my website which is uh madison film forum which is madfilm.org okay. uh there's definitely one day that's set, which is the kickoff, which will be the 26th of July okay. uh, at the Arts and Literature Lab on Winnebago Street. The details haven't been figured out. I don't know exactly what I'm showing. I'm not exactly sure how it's going to go, but it'll be a combination screening and just sort of gathering for networking for people who might want to do something like participate in the open show in, the, in, in December. I wanted to mention that he also hosted the Rooftop Cinema Series at the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art this summer. 
but that film series ended before this episode came out and we did get out a couple of times to some of the showings and it was pretty entertaining. So I would imagine the Mills Folly micro cinema series that he mentioned at the Arts and Literature Laboratory will be just as good. I recommend checking it out if you get a chance. And also speaking of the Arts and Literature Lab, I recently met with them because I saw on their site that they were looking for someone to help with audio production. And after meeting with them, uh, they have a monthly poetry reading series that they do. So I'm going to help turn each one of those readings into a podcast episode. So that's, that's pretty cool. I know last time that I mentioned that the person I was going to speak to this week did embroidery. And I kind of bumped one of the interviews up in its place. So that episode will be next time on the show. You can subscribe to the show at AmericanBandito.com slash subscribe. Until then, so long.